Okay, so the topic of today's video is cell history. We'll talk about these three fellows in a little bit. So let's get started. Okay, so when we today, when we say statements like, you know, all life is made from at least one cell. Today, that's pretty straightforward. But there was a time when this wasn't well understood. It took the invention of the microscope for cells to even be discovered to, for us to know that they even existed. And we can trace this back to 1665, this man right here, Robert Hooke. He was really the first to observe cells underneath the microscope when he examined cork cells, which is simply just really dead tree bark. And by the way, here's a fun little backstory. This picture right here, most likely not even a picture of Robert Hooke. No known portraits have survived over time because he was in a feud with this man right here. You might recognize this is Isaac Newton. When Robert Hooke died, Newton destroyed all known portraits and paintings of Robert Hooke. So we don't really know what Robert Hooke looked like, but you can't erase the contribution that Robert Hooke had in biology. So what he did, what Robert Hooke did was he examined cork, which is really just the bark of this type of oak tree right here. If we zoom on in, this is Robert Hooke's hand-drawn image of cork from 1665. And all those boxes, those little cubes that you see, those are the cork cells. Now these cells are dead. That's why they all look empty. They don't, you're not gonna see any nucleus or mitochondria or any other parts of the cell. These cork cells, the only thing you're able to see is the outer cell wall. All the other parts of the cell have deteriorated and decomposed and all we can see is the cell wall. And Robert Hooke talks about how these little boxes reminded him of tiny rooms and another name for tiny rooms, of course, are cells. So as the years and decades and centuries go by, we discover more and more about cells. Let's talk about the next stage. So as time passes, eventually something called the cell theory develops. And the cell theory has three parts. Well, first of all, let's talk about the gentleman here. The guy on the left, Matthias Schleiden, is a botanist and he studies plants. And he notices that every single sample plant that he examines, plants are made from cells. The gentleman on the right, this is Theodore Schwann. He's a physiologist, he's studying animal samples, and he realizes, hmm, all animals are made from cells. So combine these two, and it's really that all organisms are made from at least one single cell. So the next part of the cell theory that develops is that the cell is the most basic unit of life. Now, when you look in this picture, you can see cells have smaller parts, mitochondria, nucleus, rough ER. So why is the cell the basic unit of life? Why not the smaller parts? Well, the simple answer is the cell is the most basic unit because it's the smallest part that can still carry on the processes of life. Lysosomes cannot function on their own, neither can rough ERs and smooth ERs, but the cell can. So even though there's smaller parts, the cell is the most basic unit that can carry on the processes of life. And the final part of the cell theory that cells come from other cells. Well, here's a diagram of a cell. Cells don't just poof. And now there's two cells. They go through a dividing process. And, you know, Rudolf Virchow, this German doctor here, he really concluded that cells come from pre-existing cells. They go through a dividing process called mitosis. On the far left, this is one cell. And then it goes through the process of mitosis to divide itself into two cells. They don't just poof into existence. They go through this division process. Now, that brings up an obvious hole and, or problem in this theory. And, and that's, you know, where and how did the first cell ever come from? like Rudolf Virchow is saying right now, you know, that's a good question. Science does not really have a good understanding of how life on earth began. There are obviously philosophical and religious views about how life began, but from science, the scientific perspective, this is really viewed as like the mystery of mysteries. How did life begin? The search continues. Okay, let's talk about cells and their diversity. You know, here's a stereotypical biology textbook. Maybe on this page, there's a diagram, a square shaped diagram of a plant cell. And on this page, maybe a round diagram of an animal cell. Pretty much all biology books are guilty of doing this. A square shape for a plant cell, a round shape for an animal cell. But the reality is much different. Cells are incredibly diverse. And so, for example, here's a picture of a nerve cell, also called a neuron. Now, you can see the shape 
with the elongated branches. It almost looks like a tree with branches and roots coming off in a variety of directions. Well, this is because the shape helps it perform its function, which is to send electrical messages and electrical signals to and from the brain. You know, here's an analogy right here. Here's a, a map of the United States, and the lines represent major uh, highways across the country. And so the red line, that's Interstate 80. It runs east and west across the United States. If, uh, ask yourself, could you get from, could you drive from City A to City B if Interstate 80 were suddenly closed? I hope you see the answer is yes, most definitely. You just have to take a different route. Now, the red line Interstate 80 is the most direct route but you could zigzag up and down and around and eventually still get from city A to city B. Now the analogy is like the branches on a nerve cell. When we come back to this picture here, the branches send signals all around the body. And so this helps and aids the function of a nerve cell because if some of those branches are damaged, well then hopefully the signal can still travel during, uh, travel through other branches and arrive at the destination. And so the many, many branches that you see are actually an advantage to help the cell perform its function. And this is kind of a main idea here, is that the shape of a cell is related to the function that the cell performs. Another example of how diverse cells are, let's look at red blood cells. You can see that they're round and disc-like in their shape. Well, here's a vein, and when we talk about the function of red blood cells, their function is to carry oxygen throughout the body. Red blood cells have this round disc-like shape, and you can really see their advantage, I hope. It helps them roll through the twists and turns of the narrow veins and arteries that stretch all throughout the body. So yet another great example of how the shape of a cell is related to the function that it performs. Another example of the diversity of cells. Here's a skin cell. Skin cells, like the ones in this picture here, are, are flat and broad and they cover a lot of area. When you think about the function of skin cells, which is to cover and protect the body, keep things out that need to stay out, keep things in that need to stay in. And so an advantage of the skin cells being broad and flat is they overlap and they cover more area to achieve their purpose of covering and protecting the body. You know, an analogy would be like roof shingles or roof tiles. So here's a roof and you know, when it rains, the water just slides down the roof tiles and the shingles and keeps the, the elements outside of your house. Again, another great example of how the shape of a cell is related to the function that it performs. So let's talk about the two categories of cells next. The first category being the prokaryotes. These are the cells that lack a nucleus and other membrane bound organelles. A lot of organelles you probably are familiar with, they don't have. They don't have a nucleus, they don't have mitochondria, they don't have chloroplasts, they don't have lysosomes. And so these are very primitive, very ancient organisms. These are actually the oldest organisms that science has ever identified on Earth. Their fossils go back about three and a half billion years ago. These rock formations, known as stromatolites, these are rock formations created through the actions of these ancient prokaryotes here. And they are the oldest evidence of life on Earth. You know, the prokaryotes, that's kind of their fancy name, but you probably know these as bacteria. And so microscopic bacteria are prokaryotic organisms. So here's a fun analogy, I hope. You know, here's two cars. They're both cars. They're both gonna get you safely to your destination, but these cars are by no means equal. The car on top is very primitive. It's got no air conditioning, no leather interior, no sunroof, no radio. It's a stick shift, no cruise control. But the car on the bottom has all the luxury options. The car on top, the analogy is that this is a prokaryote. And the car on the bottom, the analogy is that this is a eukaryote, a more complex car and a more complex cell. Let's talk about this more. Let's look at the eukaryotes. These are the more complex cells. These are the cells that have a nucleus and membrane bound organelles. When you look at the list right here, you might recognize a lot of these from middle school. The mitochondria and the nucleus and a vacuole and Golgi bodies and rough ERs and smooth ERs. 
These are, are again just a lot more complex cells. We believe that eukaryotes evolved from prokaryotes. And if we try to explore how that happened, you know, here's a, a drawing of a large prokaryotic cell. The theory known as endosymbiosis. You know, this is the theory of how prokaryotes, we believe, slowly evolved to become eukaryotes. Well, here's a smaller prokaryote. And you can imagine the scenario where this larger prokaryote swallows up the smaller prokaryote, most likely for a food source. But uh, for whatever reason, the smaller prokaryote is just not destroyed and, and it's kept inside. And over time, the two become so dependent upon one another that the, the smaller one actually becomes a working organelle inside of the larger one. And over the millions and millions of years, as this continually happens uh, from ancestor to ancestor, uh, the organelles pile up and build up and build up. Eventually, you can see this wouldn't even qualify as a prokaryote anymore. This would qualify now as a eukaryote because it has these membrane-bound organelles that its much long ago ancestors lacked. So this is one way, this is the way how we think prokaryotes eventually evolved into, or eukaryotes, excuse me, eukaryotes eventually evolved from prokaryotes. And so these are the other forms of life, the other four big categories of, of or kingdoms of life on Earth. Members of kingdom protista, like this amoeba. Members of kingdom fungi, uh, fungi, like these mushrooms. Members of kingdom plantae, like this flower and members of kingdom animalia, like this frog. So why are cells so small? Why are they microscopic? Well, there's an easy answer to that. The easy answer is that smaller cells are much more efficient at moving molecules in, into them and moving molecules out of them. Cells generate waste and they have to get rid of the waste. Cells have needs and they need nutrients. So they need to bring nutrients in. And it's just a lot more efficient when the cells are smaller. That's the easy answer. The harder answer is that smaller cells have a greater surface area to volume ratio. So we're gonna do a little bit of math here. And so let's look at the surface area, the total area of, let's say the cell membrane here. Here's two cells, a small cell, cell A, and a larger cell, cell B. Let's calculate the surface area of cell A. Well, first of all, surface area is the length times the width times the total number of sides. So let's just pretend, nice round numbers here, the length is two micrometers, the width is two micrometers, and this cube has six sides. So the surface area would be two micrometers times two micrometers times six sides is 24 micrometers squared. Now let's do the same thing for cell B. Again, let's use nice round numbers here. Let's pretend that the, uh, the, the length is four micrometers and the width is four micrometers and it too has six sides. So the surface area comes out to be 96 micrometers squared. Well, that's the surface area. Now we need to calculate volume. And so volume is really just the size of the cell. And you might know from maybe a physical science class, maybe from middle school, that volume is length times width times height. Well, I already have the length and the width shown. Let me add the height. Let's use nice round numbers. Let's make the height two micrometers. So the volume of cell A is just two micrometers times two micrometers times two micrometers, which would be eight micrometers cubed. Let's do the same thing for cell B. I already have the length and the width. Let's make the height again, nice round number of four micrometers. And so the volume would be four micrometers times four micrometers times four micrometers, which would be 64 micrometers cubed. But uh, again, where it says hard answer, we have to calculate the surface area to volume. So in order to calculate the surface area to volume, we just have to divide the surface area by the volume. In cell A, when we look at the surface area to volume, we just divide the 24 by eight. And you notice you come up with the number of three. For cell B, the bigger cell, we divide 96 by 64 and you come up with one and a half. Notice the smaller cell has a greater number. Three is a bigger number than one and a half. So cells that have a, uh, the greater surface area to volume ratio, the bigger the number, is uh, cells are just much more efficient at moving molecules in and out. And cells that are small tend to have 
much larger surface area to volume ratios. So larger cells like cell B would struggle at moving molecules in and moving molecules out of themselves that they probably wouldn't survive. Here you have a quick history on cells. I hope you liked this video. If you're in my class, try to answer these questions and I'm happy to check your answers before class or after class one day. Thanks for watching.